。哎妈！哎。The normal for you, you like you drink three per day or two per day. <laughs> I'm feeling better. I went forty hours without a Dr. Pepper. <laughs> no, it wasn't on purpose. It was in the back seat of my busted up car that was at the lot. I traded it in. They gave me scrap value for it, but um, it was worthless to me. So, oh well. Yeah, thanks. Oh, it is. It is. To go on mobile this week, so I'm trying to just figure it out. Hello everyone. Hello, welcome to Book Chat. We are talking Miss. Uh, do we want music? Do we want background music? Hello, uh, Vaden. Thank you so much for the eighteen months. It's, you just said this book series was awesome. Thanks to Lisa, I think, for recommending we cover it and for everyone's thoughts. KP Dubs gifted a sub to Sprinkles. Yay! That's a lot of fun. We got like real time thank yous for that. Hello, PK Lord Demon. First time chatter. How are you going? Have you have you read this lovely book? It is book number three for the Mistborn trilogy that we will be covering today. Um, because this is part two, technically, we did the first half of the book last week, so we are doing the whole book, the ending, what we thought, the lot. We're talking about that today. Uh, Kate said, look, I'm glad I read it, but I'm still kind of burnt out on high fantasy series. Uh, Velox Scripter says, hello, ha sorry, howdy, Maud. Glad to be here. Thanks for the stream. Aw, thank you for saying thank you. Michelle says, hey, book friends. I'm running a little bit late with work stuff, so I'm just listening right now. I will try to be on the call in a bit. Uh, I'd love to have you in, um, and I'll keep an eye out for when you pop in and we can bring you up so that you can tell us your rating because when we do a part two of the book, we rate the book out of five, what we gave it on Goodreads. 
the some of us are following each other on Goodreads, and so I know some of the ratings already, but I don't know the why behind it. PK Lord Demon says I read all three. Reading Wax and Wayne now. I am to believe. Am I? Am I to believe that that is also in the? Excuse me, Mistborn universe, because I know that there's a couple of trilogies. I know that Chris actually knows a bunch of that, and has basically warned us. Yes, Mistborn era two, era era. Um, Chris is basically saying, well, you've injected it. The drug is in the system. Likely that you won't be able to kick the habit now that you're in. Oh, Vaden just gifted a sub to PK Lord Demon. Thank you so much, Vaden, for making people feel so welcome in our community. Appreciate that. Welcome, PK Demon Lord, and please enjoy the use of all of the um, new, exactly, emotes. Be, 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 that pop up. Um... Missed warn, yes. I missed warn you about the effects of this book. <laughs> pun. Pun, pun, pun. Thank you, Baden. 305. It just it still feels... Drugs. <laughs> Toast opposed to the fact that I know exactly what you're saying. Drugs. Drugs. Uh, drugs. We speak TikTok over in this part of town. Uh, Lumi Rup. Lumi Rup. Lumiere up. Thank you so much for the follow. Appreciate you. Welcome to Book Chat. We're talking The Hero of Ages, the third book in the first era of the Mistborn trilogy. Snorts Ashes breathes out mist. <laughs> Kate says, I feel like it should be higher than 305. I know. I surreptitiously and subconsciously pun. That's just how I, my brain works. So it's I have a lot of dependency on an audience, as a, a viewer, uh, someone in the chat doing the exclamation mark pun. Um, and sometimes it happens, maybe some have fallen through the cracks. Jerry, a big hello. I know that you didn't read the book. You kind of bowed out because the narrator was wah wah. Um, are you excited for our next book though, Jerry? I have a feeling that's a yes. SCS says, unlike Pokemon, we could never catch them all. Unique Technique says, hi, Maud. A big hello to you. Thank you also for all your comments on Instagram, especially during the brand branded posts. I really appreciate that. And I see you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's literally my form of income that I have. Um, all righty. First things first, we are going around saying what we give this book in particular, this one out of five. Thierry's excited for both Geek Bomb and Nerdist's May read. Uh, well, we haven't even done a Nerdist's April read yet, which is Dark Matter by Blake Crouch. And then May is going to be a Star Wars book. I voted for Obi-Wan. If you want the link, look up at Nerdist on Twitter. That's where you can vote. All right, we're getting some of the scores in. There's perfect scores and there's average scores and nothing in between. I gave it a four. All righty, let's get stuck into this. Pianki, why'd you give it a five? I gave it a five because I just love the series, love the book. Ate it up. I like how the stuff that was built up over the other books finally had its full payoff. The end of the book, you know, makes you cry. First time I read it, same thing. I didn't cry, but I was like, <laughs> a lot like that. Um, any spoiler thoughts? Because last week we did non-spoiler thoughts. You got any spoiler thoughts for this one? No. I liked how... One of the major hints came from the very first page of book one, where in the epigraph, right at the very beginning. Um, Which I didn't I listen to, to look for a while. Quote. Sean AFK has just subbed for three months. Saying, yay, it's finished. Yes, we are going full spoilers this week, Sean. Go ham. Tell us everything. We're currently rating it out of five. Um, Pianki in the chat has just said that one of the favorite parts was the foreshadowing. The fact that in the very, very first epilogue of the entire book, 
it dropped a nugget of information for us. So we are I found the quote. Yeah, what is it? They say I will hold the future of the entire world on my arms. On my arms. Yeah, very specific wording. Mm. It gives you a very big hint right from Not the on my shoulders, not in my hands, on my arms. And that was one of the first things we ever read. And remember, like, let's take it back down memory lane. When I first talk, talked about the first book, I felt for the first half of the book, the epilogues were just whooshed, over my head. They weren't sinking in. I wasn't taking note of them because they didn't make sense. We didn't have the tangible information of what they were. Boy, did that change in this book when it was Sazed's scripture. I was like, oh, wow. Now it's one of my favorite parts. Um, but initially, yeah, we had we were learning all this information when we hadn't even just like obtained any of that information yet. So to go back, I will say this series. Thank you, Michelle. Look at that. Thanks for nine months. Appreciate it. Uh, three and a half. Oh, three and a half out of five. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Um, the readability, the re-readability of these series. Like I love it when they drop things. This is why mysteries are so much fun as well. Because you read it, you get the answer, and then you go, wait a gosh darn second. Because he, 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 he. It's just a trail of crumbs that I wasn't hungry enough to eat. Nah, that analogy was four out of 10. Uh, but thank you for that one. Five out of five. Are you going to read it again? Was it your first time reading the series, Pianki? That was my second time through it. And probably eventually sometime in another decade or two, I'll read it again. Yeah. Love that. Um, KP Dubs, great story with you. We did the trilogy and we covered a book every other month. You wanted to participate. So Coming into the third book, this one here, The Hero of Ages, you decided in 10 days to read the first two books and the first half of the third book. You smashed out something like 1,800 pages in 10 days. Now that you are at one with the series, how did you find it all? I was really happy with the way it ended. I liked how they tied things together. And uh, an interesting point that I liked was how in the first book, the person you think who's going to be the hero of it all, Kelsier, he dies. And this sort of background character in the first book, this servant of the house or whatever, ends up being the big hero at the end. But yeah. I found that to be an interesting twist. Um, but yeah, this definitely has um, me wanting to read it again just to see if I can find all those clues that were right there in front of our face the whole time kind of read overall we have turned kb dubs into a full book nerd and i'm so proud of you thank you <laughs> uh sean afk says i had a really hard time with the, with the ending of this at first vin and ellen dying was a lot for me we are going to get into the ending and breaking the whole thing down um so i'd love to hear more thoughts on that when we get there um Oh, GK Gamer, GK Gamer fan, if you haven't read the book for a little bit, we will, If you, and you need anything explained further, hit us up. We will absolutely catch you up on all those things again as well. Um, Lisa, you gave this a five, I believe. Yeah, I gave the whole series a five because I just love it so much. <laughs> it's, it's definitely one of those, I'm sure it probably could be lower, but I, my enjoyment factor and how much I love the characters and I love how everything panned out, I just, it's a five. <laughs> you commented that there were so many hints that I picked up on this time that I didn't see the first read through. Can you bring some of those up, some of the major, the bigger ones? Um. Uh, some of this just subtle stuff when reading through this time that I caught just because I knew it was there is um, every time Vin was pulling in the mist was when she didn't have earring in. And, um, you know, every time she was hearing and seeing ruin was <laughs> when it wasn't. So it's just little things like that you didn't pick up on right away. So, like, I didn't, I didn't notice, uh, some of the other characters when they were hearing the voice of ruin i didn't yeah. notice that or think about the fact that they had been had metal in them somehow so i didn't pick up on any of that until um like way late in the third book so 
what was Zane's medal? Because that was when it was like really starting to hit the nail <laughs> in the head. <laughs> I, don't, Literally. I don't remember what type. I don't remember what type of metal was, but he had something in his chest. Right. But that was the first time that it was like the voice belonged to God and God was yeah. saying kill. Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, Chris, you gave it a five out of five. Do you want to drop a comment and let me know your spoiler thoughts on why that was? Uh, and I can read that out. Kate, three and a half out of five. Three out of five. Miss Necromancer, you are unmuted. That, oh, I heard something. I know that you're on mobile. Hello? There you are. Hello. Okay. Sorry, I had to let my cat out. That's <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'd say, I think it's probably like 3.5, but Goodreads doesn't let you do decibel points, so I rounded down. But maybe when I'm feeling less burnt out on fantasy, it might round up to four. I don't know. But I think for me, the series, I like this board the most. And I kind of like, liked the sequels less and less. The first you know, one like you Miss liked Born the most. A, yeah. Yeah. And then Miss Bourne was the, my favorite. And then I liked Will of Ascension a little bit less. And, and then this one a little bit less as well. Interesting. Um, your mic's cutting in and out, but I do want to learn a little bit more from you because you will have pockets and spikes of things that you like. You'd be like, the majority of it kind of sucked and I had problems with this, but this thing was cool. It's not that I thought it sucked. It was, there's just like a couple things that, you know, I didn't love. And I personally don't super love when series get super religious. That's just a personal thing that it's just like, I find kind of boring. So the fact that the third book was very kind of the mythos of their religion. I was kind of like, just meh. Right. So that's just like my own personal preference. Uh, but, you know, I really liked how it was Marsh in the end who kind of freed Vin, where he finally, because there's even a comment that um, in one of the epitaph sets, like it would take someone of incredible will to resist ruin for that long. I thought he mentioned that even maybe. No, I thought it was in like the beginning of a chapter where that was mentioned, but yeah, that Marsh, the, all this time, he was just holding this little bit of willpower to, you know, change the tide of everything. You know what I mean? Do you, do you know what vibes that gave me? And I'll probably mention this again when we talk about it in best and worst moments. Um, but do you remember, oh my gosh, all the names of, I used to do podcasts on it. I was you know, a, an expert on it. I did shows on it. Game of Thrones, the priest, the Lord of Light, the Bar Baron, Baron, hmm, someone will tell me. Basically the Lord um, of Light. Dundarian? Yes, Beric, Beric Dundarian. Yeah, that's the one whose only purpose, he kept dying and getting brought back. He got brought back six times because the only purpose that his life was was to do one thing, distract the Night King or do one thing so that Arya could kill the Night King. That was his only purpose. And that's what it kind of felt like with um, Marsh as well. He went through hell. He, His story arc kind of was like, he was the brother and then he was like and then the insider and then kind of kept spiraling a little bit by book two you're like uh oh we lost him and then learning that he was exactly the same thing his entire purpose was for a single moment so I thought that was really interesting uh I'm going to read out some comments and then Baden will move over to you um uh, KB Dub says, yes, I started to get that early in book three. Vin's connection with the mists and the earring. Sean AFK says, this book and the trilogy overall was a five out of five for me the first time through. I actually think it might be lower on a reread, only because Sanderson has grown as an author a ton since. Interesting. PK Lord Demon says, I love Spook becoming a full Mistborn. I know, if it happened to Ellen, it should have happened to Spook. I like the spooks become the new Kelsier. Like, oh, you wanted it so bad. 
Um, Vaden says, yeah, he ripped Vin's earring out to allow the mists to go into her so she could go full Super Saiyan. Uh, KP Dub says, yeah, and Marsh had to disguise it as a part of bloodlust that he was uh, was in to fool Ruin. Uh, oh, really? Trisco says Marsh isn't dead. I totally thought he died. KP Dub says Marsh didn't get the girl, <laughs> didn't get to lead the rebellion, didn't get to be the hero. But one little sliver of rebellion that no one will ever know about saved the world. This is what uh, hero, hero, heroism looks like sometimes, you know, because I guess true altruism is you do what needs to be done, not for the glory, not for the notoriety, which is something that Kelsey has struggled with a little bit. Okay, what happened to Marsh? Marsh got the bing, ring through the head, got, managed to take that out. R-A-F-O. What's R-A-F-O? Randomly altering future options? Read and find out. Oh. <laughs> I prefer mine. <laughs> um, Marsh is not dead. What do you mean read and find out? I just bloody read it. I was also at the dog park throwing a ball to my dog. Sean says, for people who really enjoyed this trilogy, I would highly recommend reading the novella Mistborn Secret History while the events of this trilogy are fresh in your head. It's actually a pretty interesting read. Kay says, I found all the stuff with the Chandra and Spook really interesting, but I just found Ellen uh, became an albatross around the book's neck in terms of my interest. His chapters were so boring to me and I still don't like him becoming a Mistborn. Oh, it's a future for the, uh, it's a spoiler for the future books. Okay. Got it. Got it. See, I, when it comes to me and I'm absolutely a lot of the time on my own for this, um, I think it, this is like a byproduct of not having huge ups and downs. I just coast in the middle, which means I'm not like super obsessive or protective over particular things. I have interests, but it's not like live or die. Uh, so I'm okay with getting spoiled. <laughs> you know, someone's like, oh, and then this happened. And you're like, oh, I haven't read it yet. They're like, oh, sorry. And you're like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> uh, here we go. Marsh retired and moved into a cottage at the coast of Rome. He trains pigs to find truffles now. I like that. Marsh deserves that. You're also explaining my life in Stardew. <laughs> I just double checked the book and after Marsh beheads Ellen, yeah. he just isn't mentioned again. So we assume, I guess he just ran off. But they didn't say it. I just thought that because everyone was dying because it was turning full tragedy. I was just like, everyone's dead. Sure. Uh, for those joining us, I just saw the view count. Uh, welcome. This is Book Chat with Geek Bomb. My name is Maud Garrett. I like reading fantasy and sci-fi books. And we have just finished a trilogy, the Mistborn trilogy by Brandon Sanderson. We've read it every other, a book every other month. Uh, and the way that we cover books around here is we do it the first two Wednesdays of the month. The first Wednesday is the first half of the book. So we'll talk about characters. We'll talk about themes. We'll talk about events are unfolding uh we'll talk about predictions we'll do fan casting and then the second part the second wednesday which is we talk about the whole darn book full spoilers hey there billy sunrider i see you thanks so much for the sub uh you will hear voices they are not in my head they are not ruin they are the lovely participants of book chat through the discord which you can sign up to. $5 a month gets you access to participate in both of the Geek Bomb book clubs and it also gets you exclusive access to Nerdist book clubs after show. That takes place on the last Wednesday of every month. It is not recorded. You can only be there if you get the access uh, and that's when myself and my co-host Rachel Hine and Hector Navarro have real discussions, unfiltered, very vulnerable because we know that it's not being recorded. Uh, and that's a lot of fun as well. Lisa's just put in that link to the, why isn't it coming up? Patreon. 
Why aren't it going up? Maybe, maybe I have to do it. There we go. Um, you can sign up there. We'd love to have you because I think it's one of the coolest um, online book clubs that we have. We have quality. We also have a Goodreads. Check that out. We're doing a vote for June's book at the moment. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> book. Um, Vaden, thoughts on the book, please. Yeah, I love the book, especially in the series as a whole. Um, especially in the last book, because it's it's like you know like a accumulation of all we have learned. Yeah. So the world building has gone through everything. We we now we know about all the medals for the most part. There's a couple medals that they talked about being uh, unknown for the future, but otherwise we got like all the threads were resolved for the most part. We learned about like the history of preservation of ruins of the world, like the, all, bunch of all the characters got there like story arcs resolved it was almost perfect almost perfect that's about as good as i get <laughs> i can't really that's say true. It perfect that's true that is true um chris says action puzzles little romance good book i like that uh billy sunrider says oh yay i'm not late you are not late we are going we've just gone through uh the discord members uh, thoughts where they've rated it out of five. My thoughts, I rated it, this book, this book in particular, a four out of five. If we could do halves or quarters, I'd probably bump it up a little bit. Um, but I, I liked it more than Will of Ascension, not as much as Mistborn. One of the reasons why is this little thing called stakes inflation that I like to talk about. Uh, you see it a lot with anime. You see it a lot with... Um, Basically, it goes from end of a situation to the end of the world. Um, and like X-Men, oh, wow, this, this one particular person is going to hurt everyone. And then there's a huge fight. You have to build the army. And then all of a sudden, the whole of the first book training to get that power almost becomes obsolete. And everyone instantly has that ability and can instantly fight. And the showdown is so inflated is how I describe it. Um, and I think that stakes inflation gets a little bit hard for me when it, I, I think it, when it's more concentrated and you spend a lot of time in that story, learning the abilities. And in this instance, it was just the Lord ruler as the big bad. Um, and he was oppressing all the land, right? And so they had to take him down. And then of course there's something, there's, there's always a bigger fish. And so when it kind of became sort of like gods that needed an army and all of a sudden we've got 200 and something misborns that are just going out and fighting even though they'd only just learn how to burn metal when in the first book we see Vin, who's supposed to be incredibly talented, take a year to get that good. That is not a super gripe, but I struggle to be as invested in that, which is why I think book one was my favorite. Sean says, yeah, this is a thing you'll see in a lot of Sanderson's writing. If it bothers you here, it'll more than likely bother you in his other work as well. He's very much obsessed with the idea of characters leveling up and the power levels skyrocketing as the story goes on. I don't hate it. Like I watched all of Dragon Ball, you know, Dragon Ball Z and they kept Super Saiyan, Super Saiyan 2, Super Saiyan 3. Now we look like rock stars. I'm like, okay, yeah, <laughs> I'm down. But if you want me to care as much, uh, Pianki says, yeah, 300 ATM misting. ATM expands the mind and makes them capable of using the new sensory information. It doesn't bug me that they could fight well from the first time burning it. What bugged me, and they addressed it really quickly after, when it was like, yeah, they just killed... 40 Kolos in five minutes. I'm like, your arms would be so sore. <laughs> Unless you've been like, I guess they're soldiers. But like that kind of endurance and stamina, there's a reason why you need to burn pewter and they didn't have pewter. Yeah, Jag says they're already warriors. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Um, and then they, they also did say like through Ellen's mind point of view, he's like, wow, I'm getting really tired. <laughs> I'm running out of pewter to burn and I need to burn pewter. So I get that. Um, it does, it, it makes sense, don't get me wrong. Um, Sean says it 
So criticism I see about his writing a lot that I think is super valid. It just doesn't really bother me though. Yeah, I get that. I am Mix says, I love all the characters in the trilogy. People always talk about Sanderson's world building and magic, but the characters, especially in the first book and the Kandra character, I can't remember the name of, Tensoon. And the one before that was, oh my gosh. Also, thank you, Vaden. Uh, yes, great characters. I agree with you in that one. Toaster Post says, this trilogy is put together incredibly well, like a Nolan movie, but like a Nolan movie, it lacks heart. It lacked uh, camaraderie, this book. It, and the second one I felt as well a little bit. Uh, they split the party, first and foremost. You're never supposed to split the party. That's a and d rule. Uh, but they split the party in this one where Spook was out there doing that thing and Bree is kind of hung back here and then Caesar had to do his thing. So it just didn't have, I think the the lack of heart comes from not having that ensemble, you know. Remember back in book one, it felt like a Ocean's Eleven kind of feel where everyone had their ability or their role and they had the target and they had to work together and you learnt about everyone's strengths and weaknesses and coming together as a whole and why it worked and that, how that was important. We just didn't have that as much and that was one of my gripes which we'll go into. Uh, Amari V, Inge Rafa, thank you so much for the follows. Welcome to Book Chat. We're talking about the Mistborn trilogy, full spoilers. So if you got any thoughts... Lay them on the table over here. Chris says, we need a geek bomb book rating system. I would say a book is five out of 10 chocolates, <laughs> but more date the other five. <laughs> I really did. I love chocolate. <laughs> I love chocolate. Uh, since when is D7D a team game? Oh, D&D? D&D. Since when is D&D a team game? Every time. Every time. D&D is a team game. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> Uh, Jack says it's cool that them fighting wasn't even to win the act of fighting itself. Oh, hold on. It's also cool that them fighting wasn't even to win. The act of fighting itself was them winning. Yes, the fact that they had to burn through all the ATM because it was Ruin's body. Oh, nine bombs. We could we could say the bombs. We also could say how many, yeah, how many bombs do you give it? And it's like I gave it oh, 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 four bombs. Or you could do these ones that I love the most. Four exploding bombs. That could be fun. Hey, Gaia, how are you? Um, Billy Sunrider says the absolute opposite for me. I have never cried so much at the end of the book. It was so beautiful bringing all the religions into the end game got me. Oh, I love that that got you like that, though. That's great. I mix says I also wish there was more ferricomy uh, throughout. I think I would have enjoyed a trilogy about ferricomists at least half again as much as I liked Mistborn. Uh, I am mix. if you are new around here, I have to, to remember how to say that word, ferricomy. I have to pretend I'm stubbing my toe because it sounds like, fuck me, uh, ferricomy. And so that's why I said it like I was getting punched in the gut. Um, Vaden also agrees with Billy Sunrider saying, I love that part as well, especially since he was able to combine his scholarly knowledge of history and theology to allow him to become the best God. KP Dub says the one who lost faith the hardest, not only had his faith renewed, but became God. There we go. We're dropping the bombs for our scores now. Jimmy gives it three chocolates. Kate gives it three exploding bombs. GK Gamma Fan gives it five exploding bombs. Mac Nunn says, Maud, asking this because I'm in this position, how did you make new friends after moving to the US? Sincerely, a person not good at connecting. Hey, Mac Nunn, we're talking about a book. Vin struggled, struggled making friends, but she was the chosen one. Um, I made friends because my uh, a friend of mine moved to America and when I landed, she says, hey, I've been here for a year. Here are all my friends. They're now your friends. And I made other friends through work. I do that a lot. Every time I move, I will work and build friendships that way. I find it to be authentic. I hope that helps. I hope that helps. Just kidding gives it four bombs. Wow, look at all these explosions. Shell giving it three-ish exploding bombs. All right, the next topic we are going to be talking about is the ending. 
We are going full-blown discussion into the ending. Uh, again, if anyone in the Discord has anything that they want to jump in and say, feel free to unmute. I can see when you do, and I will head it over to you. Uh, I'd love to have more sort of like banter about this. Uh, Reverse Eon says, hi, Maud. Hi, Reverse Eon. Thank you, first time chat. Welcome, welcome. We are talking about the Hero of Ages, the third installment of the Mistborn trilogy, Era One by Brandon Sanderson. If you love fantasy books and you've read it, let's have a chat. If you haven't read it, we recommend it. <laughs> uh, if you're just here to lurk, I appreciate it. Apologies that you won't understand majority of what we say. Toast Post, you gave this book a three exploding bombs out of five? Oh, okay. Alrighty, so the ending. Here are some of the talking points that I've written down in the document that the Discord has access to. Shakespearean tragedy. What would you have changed? The Marsha arc. Why does it always autocorrect? The Chandra Kolos Inquisitor's purpose finally revealed. Burning all that atium. The reveal of the mists. Vin becoming a god. And Vaden says the return of the world with green plants and flowers. So if you've got anything to add to that, great. But let's kick it off with the fact that our two main protagonists, Vin turns into a god, materializes, dies. Elend becomes full mistborn, charges the army, burns Ruin's body, a.k.a. Atium, and then gets beheaded. <laughs> Did you see the double death coming? Who wants to weigh in on this? Oh, Michelle, you're in the chat. Hey, love. I don't want to hear from you why you gave it a three out of ish out of five. Uh, yeah, so I sometimes find it more helpful to take books out of the do I like it or do I not like it category and put into it. Do I find it interesting and do I not or do I not find it interesting in this book? I, I liked it, but I found it more interesting than I liked it. I don't know if that makes sense, especially because I knew that I was going to read it with the um book club and that always makes everything better um yes because you get different perspectives and people thinking in different ways yeah so i think it was a great book for book club um because it's it i knew that it would be a lot of fun to talk about and there would be a lot of interesting things to talk about but as far as just reading it i don't know if i liked it but i do find it interesting okay what was the thing that you connected with the least i guess I think I found it, it kind of gave me whiplash a little bit in terms of just being all over the place and people were moving so fast. And um, I, I almost would have preferred if there had been more time in maybe different books where we were spending more time with the other characters. Um, and I, I think that Ellen was definitely the weakest point and I think that maybe if he had had some time like away from Vin to develop some of his own personality and go into that a little bit more that would have made it stronger for me but as it was it was just like it was there and there and then they were just appearing in other places and you know I, I just was like okay this is just this is what it is now I hear you with that yeah I felt like their relationship was like tiny little bit of ooh, is there something here oh she likes what he likes and he maybe he's interesting and then boom they're together and it's like they had yeah. the most like unrelationship relationship i find yeah it, it was just like what do i know he wasn't their own i didn't feel like ellen was his own person basically yeah and I feel like out of all the things that character developments that happened, his was a little bit too convenient. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just going to do something a little bit tricky only because it's somewhat hard to read the chat. Where do you think I saved that image? I'm just going to put a little black box behind the chat so we can read the chat <laughs> maybe even save it on the desktop i don't know where i've saved this bloody thing hold on one second everyone <laughs> nothing oh here we go it can't be 
downloaded securely. Rude. Hey, this one's free. Um, I just, you know, I learn on the on the fly sometimes. That's all. And that should have, yay. Oh, oh. Ah, Maud, that sucks. Okay, well, I tried. <laughs> it was just a place to fit behind here so you could read the words. All right, sorry. Um, I'm going to read some of the chats. Thank you, Michelle, for that one. Uh, um, did you, we discussed the fact that Ellen's a little bit of a muffet. Um, you gave it three. You're hoping to connect with other parts of this book through the other members of the book club. Agree. Agree with that. Are you excited to read some sci-fi? Yes. Okay, cool. Especially um, when we read The Martian. Yeah. Martian May. Okay. Some of the comments that have just come in. KP Dub says ATM was like the main currency, like ATM. TJ says, as someone who doesn't read but would like to, how do you get past the, uh, the anxiety, overwhelmness, and find time to read? Great question, TJ. I listen to books now. Uh, I used to be a big reader. I would find myself reading for hours at a time. Uh, I would read before bed and then the phone really messed with me. Um, so I multitask. I walk my dog for like half an hour to an hour, sometimes even longer every morning. And so while I'm out and about walking her, I'm listening to the audiobook, and I found that I can really consume a lot of books that way. I hope that helps. Um, Alvac says, oh, what did Toaster Poster to say? Your opinion is valid, Toaster Poster. To Don't let it keep you down. Hmm. Uh, and yeah, Jimmy says the same thing. Take it one page at a time, or if you prefer, try an audiobook. Uh, Kate agrees with Michelle. I like this book more because of book club. If I just read it on my own, I, would have, I wouldn't have appreciated this. Oh, hold on. I would have appreciated the stuff I did less because I would have been madder about the stuff that I found boring slash didn't like. That's why I love book club as well. The amount of times I'm like, oh, this is what I thought. And someone's like, really? I thought this. And I'm like, oh, that's so clever. And it brings a whole new dimension to, yeah, how I consumed something. And I always think that's so interesting. We all read the same words, but we can all take something so different from it. Um, Chris says the world and magic system is neat, even if you don't like the characters. I so want to play a TTRPG in this world. Chris, you have just opened that door. I want you to build me a character. I want to know D&D stats, what allomantic ability you have, the name, your backstory, your goal, Fungens and Flagons style. Billy says, I felt the same way about Ellen's my first read, but his reasoning becomes more clear the second time around. Oh. Um, Kate says, you can also do audiobooks at a much higher speed and you have a hard, uh, you have a, if you have a hard time concentrating, it can actually help you focus more on the audiobooks if you have ADHD. Um, I think quite a few of us have a spectrum of ADHD I listen to my books on 1.5 minimum. And that's how I, A, can read a lot more and B, listen. When they talk so slowly, I've already spaced out. Sean says, you know what? Sanderson just can't write, write a romance well, in my opinion. It's always the least interesting part for me and I'm normally not put off by romance in stories. Hard agree. Does anyone else want to weigh in on the way that Sanderson wrote romance in this trilogy in particular? Actually, Lisa, I'm going to throw it over to you, our romance expert. <laughs> what was lacking here? <laughs> um, I don't know if I want to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Sexy time. <laughs> Any kind of chemistry. Any chemistry. <laughs> Heavy breathing. <laughs> <laughs> anything that I mean, says that these two people are attracted to each other <laughs> i mean you see my good read so i certainly have <laughs> and every now and then i'll be like oh what's this what's this one like oh ooh. i also learned the term today because i have to i have to really really expire um 
my genre, my self-proclaimed genre of phase fucking. Uh, romanticy. Romanticy. That is my genre of choice. It is a lot better than phase fucking. I will say though, shout out to Vaden who said, you know what? I like the idea of fairies and, and you know, Celtic mythology. Maud, what are these books that you read? And I went bright red <laughs> and said, Vaden, <laughs> it is not about Celtic mythology. These are like female gays, like Disney on adult crack, like, but I was like, I talk about these books enough that it would be really interesting for a guy to understand, especially since we've read so many male authors, white male authors in fantasy, what characters and what um, dialogue and, you know, how things are described when it's from women. So this is literally like an educational piece on what women want. So Vaden is reading A Court of Thorn and Roses which I'm so excited about. Vaden, how are you finding that book, by the way? <laughs> Vaden, you started it? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, so yeah, I, I started the book, I'm most of the way through. It's good, like, I don't think that really is that crazy. Like, it's it's a good book with good world building, interesting, you know, Lord, all that stuff. The romance isn't that heavy or anything. Like, it's like, if you don't like the romance or if it's the romance gets a little too strong for you, it's not like in your face all the time. It's just there when it's important, you know, but it's not there all the time, like oh, over everything. There, <laughs> like are, a, there are five books, Faden. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I was going to say <laughs> just wait. Okay. So <laughs> eventually it might change, but uh, I mean, I'm liking the book. I think it's good. So if people like fantasy and there is one where it takes a sharp turn, <laughs> a sharp turn. <laughs> Uh, you can't read it in public. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Uh, also, Alvac, I really appreciate that burn. Earlier when I was trying to do a graphics thing, <laughs> Alvac says, this is why Maud is hiring a new graphics artist. <laughs> oh, Billy Sunrider is talking about romance that works in Stormlight, and that is the Shallon and Adelin romance. Yay, there's some that exists. That's good. Uh, Just Kidding says, as a longtime fan of Brando Sando, I genera generally agree. Romance is definitely a weakness of his. Sean says, I've been reading Wheel of Time and it's the same thing, where there are some implications that characters may be like each other and then five minutes later they're in a deeply committed relationship. And I'm like, wait, what happened? <laughs> they're missing like 10 steps and these are the teething problems. The first three months of a relationship are the most important and intense and they're your make or break by around the three month mark because you know you've got the best versions of each other you are learning about each other you are learning what you like you are figuring out how to be comfortable there is a level of excitement and that honeymoon phase and then the sort of the perfect mask comes off because it's unattainable to continue that for so long that's the relationship stuff if you're like Lisa and I, we love that honeymoon phase. <laughs> it's exciting. And one of the better parts of a new relationship, according to authors that we read. Uh, Haran3030, thank you so much for the follow. We're talking I got about- a bad feeling about this. We're talking about smart. <laughs> Get out of here. I got a great feeling about it. Um, yeah, Wheel of Time. Except in the show, um, there was that moment where she was just like, I like you. And then they went to Pound Town. <clears throat> it's on the map if you look it up. Uh, Toaster Poster says this book felt like The Wizard from 1989. The big reveal in the movie was Mario 3. <laughs> the Mistborn, in Mistborn, sorry, the big reveal was a full magic system and history of the world. There are some great moments, but I wanted more. I'd love to hear what more, what else you wanted with that one. Baden says, I liked Ellen and Vin's relationship more than most. Their trust in each other was critical to taking down ruins since it could hear and read everything said. Tr that kind of trust takes fucking ages. <laughs> that kind of trust takes trial and error. That kind of trust isn't a click your fingers, he's a mist. No, that checks out. If he can become a mistborn that quickly, he can gain that kind of trust that quickly. It's just not accurate. <laughs> 
Uh, TJ says, Maud, how do you keep your mind on the audio and not wandering off about other things? It does all the time. The more meditation you do, the better you are at focusing though. I've learned to meditate a little bit more. I still suck at it, but I get better. When my mind does wander off and I realize it, I have to skip back about 90 seconds each time. Kate says, honestly, Vin and Ellen didn't feel married to me. They felt more like siblings or just platonic friends. Kate, what would... Brando Sando had to have done for that to feel more authentic, this relationship, instead of it just fast forwarding through the trials and tribulations of a relationship. I don't, like I said in the comments, he didn't need to add any kind of like deep dicking sex scene or anything like that, but there was no relationship there. You know what I mean? Like anything they talked about with trust was talking about a war and not what was happening between them. You know what I mean? Everything in their relationship was situational to everything around them. And I had nothing, it could have been, you could have plunked any two people together and have them talk about the exact same thing. Like there was nothing. There wasn't even trauma bonding. Between... That's how you can build trust really quickly. Not in like even... a... There wasn't even and that. didn't even do that. No. Like, I mean. That would have made yeah, sense. Yeah, there was like other. There was other characters who were trauma bonding, but not Vin and Ellen. And it's like, there was no flirtatiousness that you have when you're in like a new marriage or a new relationship. And yeah, like there was almost, this is gross to say that Sean AFK said there was more heat between Zane and Vin. Yeah. And that was like a toxic, terrible, terrible ro relationship. But it had more of a relation, like a sexual relationship dynamic. It did. It had Vin tension. It had like, tension. That's why I say Vin and Ellen's relationship is like friends or siblings. It's, be it's, no... it's beige. Yeah, it's very, very anything like that. You know what I mean? And that's why I was like, no, like, because I, is like, I can sell toxic masculinity to the shit guys. So I'm not saying that, but that's just how gray Vin and Ellen felt. I feel like we need a bit of clarity. First thing, um, a couple of things, really. There's a little bit to unpack here. Galactic Sean has waited and lurked, and the first thing that they wanted to say in the comment was DDing uh, as a uh, indication of how you've described a version of romance as double dicking, which I lost the plot, which brings us to the next point, which was... Um, it, it, Brandon Sanderson made it quite clear that Ellen was terrible with his dueling cane. <laughs> and that's, that's what I got the giggles about. <laughs> anyway, it just, he would be such a dud root. <laughs> Ellen would suck in the bedroom. Anyway, uh, there's another point in here about both of them are now misborn. They can burn pewter. Do with uh, that what you will. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, also, we really need to clear up the fact that Sean has said, whoa, 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 that's not what I was trying to say at all about Zane. Uh, I think because you just mentioned Zane in the comment, Sean, that reminded Kate of a previous, well, the only other semi relationship that Vin has had with a man. Um, and there was more tension between these two in an incredibly toxic way, but it was a more believable sort of like tension that we just haven't had with Ellen at all. Ellen and Vin remind me of those couples that you see in restaurants that don't talk the whole night because they've been together for 50 years and that just shouldn't be what they are. Um, just kidding says, lol, it's beige. Uh, lol, uh, it's beige is a great description of their relationship. Um, True Scorn says, magic power and sex. You think there would have been a reference slipped in? TJ just says filth, pure filth. Uh, yeah, Kate, I called it. Great, cool. Um, Vaden says, does this mean if they burn ATM, it becomes better or ruined? Pun, Vaden. Pun. That's a that's an interesting question, though. We're applying logic to something that was a little tongue in cheek. Uh, and the cartographer says, book one, Ellen and Vin had a better connection than married Ellen and Vin. One hundred percent. There was that sort of like, that what if, do they, don't they, will they, won't they, that is exciting. Um, Sean, logic, says tin would make it better. 
uh, earlier when we first started the Mistborn discussion, we asked everyone what uh, alimantic power would you want if you could burn one metal? That's a really good argument for Tin. Toast of Poster says, I like your take, Maud. It needed more camaraderie. Vin was sidelined to develop Ellen's character. Oh, that's it. That's 100% what, the, what it was. Vin was sidelined to develop Ellen's character. Bellen's character. It's just a vague feeling I have right now. I need to think about this more. Take all the time you need. I'll be right here. Um, interesting conversation. It took a it took a little turn. Uh, let's just make sure I. Oh, here we go. I mean, the cartographer says I would have loved to have seen a bit more spice or conflict even between Vin and Ellen. It was just super Romeo and Juliet. We're used in love in a time of conflict. We're both going to die for our cause. That's why I said Shakespearean tragedy. Um, usually in Shakespeare, you know, it's a comedy or a, or a drama, and usually with the with the tragedy. Um, you know, your main character dies. Uh, usually if it's for love, vengeance, whatever it is, but there's death. Um, did they need to die? Yes or no? I don't know if we want to poll for this, but do you think Ellen and Vin needed to die to tell this story? Does anyone want to have uh, chime in with that one? While we're building up the courage to join the discussion, Kate has said, uh, that's actually a married phenomenon. People can be in a relationship for a long time before marriage, but as soon as they get married, there is a change because they believe the societal bullshit roles that have been pounded into us, that you are now a husband and wife and there are expectations for that. So you start to fall into those patriarchal, patriarchal roles. Sorry. Uh, I'm very anti-marriage, so I wholeheartedly buy into that. Ha ha ha. Ah, PK says, with all that steel pushing and iron pushing, it would make for a great sex scene. That's the only pushing and pulling apart from travel that makes that alimantic power interesting at all. See, this is a thing. We're having a conversation about this for like 10 minutes and we've found already like four other ways to make any kind of... Ah... Uh... This is... I'm having an epiphany. That's what that face is. Alimantic powers and metals is physics, right? Is that physics? Because we're, we're not really talking about biology. It's physics because you can't write about chemistry. Or is the whole thing actually chemistry? Metals. Metals is chemistry or is metal physics? I fucking hate science. The... Periodic table, is that physics or chemistry? Both, says Lariga. Thank you so much for chiming in. It's chemistry. Okay, cool, cool. It's probably more chemistry, which is a subset of physics. Physics is everything. All right. So the conclusion that I've drawn is Brando Sando spent so long working on the chemistry of the world building, literally with metals, burning metals, that he could not have burning desires. <laughs> Clip that. That is, that is what I've come up with. This book was so metal. But yeah, it can only, there was only room for one kind of chemistry and that was the entire magic base system. Uh, um, but thank you for chiming in on that one. Tedekin says uh, aluminium is on the periodic table. Good, good. P says, uh, PK says, physics and chemistry and biology. Um, Kate says, the unit character also had more sexual desire than Ellen. <sighs> like, if that's not a wake up, I just want to shake him. I would scream that at Ellen. I'd be like, the damn unit has more desire than you do. Uh, Loruga says, I learned orbitals in chem and physics, which are a huge part of metals. Thank you so much for particip participating in the conversation, by the way. Uh, he writes, fair romancy, <laughs> romancy. Um, Kate says, let's write the most pornographic Mistborn fanfic ever. <laughs> um, other parts of the conversation that I missed, Born, uh, was from Just Kidding. My phone battery's about to die, so I'll just oh, say I love good, uh, book club. 
Yay. Thank you. Just kidding. Sean says, I, it kind of feels like Sanderson had a place where he just wanted to reach Vin and needed her to just kind of be around until it was time for it to happen. Um, it feels like she exists through book two and three to get to the point where she can become a god. Uh, Sean, I think that Toaster Poster kind of said exactly what that was, which was Vin's character as a whole was sidelined to develop Ellen's further. Um, Jimmy's the only one who answered the question about did they need to die? Jimmy says no, they didn't need to die. Uh, so let's go back to that discussion, the Shakespearean ending, now that we've got our smut stuff out of there. Uh, Chris has said, I would never write fanfic, Hyde. I'm pretty sure you wrote smored fanfic, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> uh, Toaster Poster says Sanderson tried to write about chemistry and got no reaction. <laughs> Pun. Jag, uh, can we nominate that pun? That was fantastic. I think we can nominate a pun to someone. <sighs> no, I just gave myself a pun. I swear we could do a shout out for a pun. <sighs> Gory knows how. Uh, Jag says, so if you read the secret projects from his Kickstarter, two of the secret project books will kind of be him specifically attempting romance instead of it just ending up like part of these stories. Oh. BS got some. Good on him. Vaden, Vaden says something to do with pun points, but I don't know the command. Oh, yes, pun points. Does that work? Yay! That was a tre punto supposed to. You've been awarded 83 arbitrary pun points. Fantastic. Thank you, Vaden. Appreciate that. Reverse Eon says, that's actually a great idea. I'll start writing some Maud fanfic ASAP. No. <laughs> no. Because it will be devastating when fictional Maud is getting more than real Maud. That will be too brutal for me. Thank you very much. Lisa says, I don't think uh, I'd say they needed to die, but I'm not too mad about it. It would have been uh, more upset if only one of them lived. Yeah, it was a little bit the fact that they both died in peace is kind of very notebook-y. Uh, Chris says they were gifts for his wife and she said she, oh, really? And he says you could pu publish them. Ooh. Sean says it will definitely be the most prudish romance books ever written, but I hope the practice helps him in his future works at least. Tedekin says, hey, Maud fanfic, she hunts werewolves. In my Maud fanfic, she hunts werewolves. Oh, that's exciting. That sounds very ambitious. <laughs> Where am I going to find werewolves? At home? I don't leave the house. Keep it up says, yeah, I was fine with Vin dying once. Ellen also died. There you go. Um, Kate says they had so much power creep. That they had so much power creep that there was really nowhere else for those characters to go. Yeah, it was like a balloon and then it burst. Sean says, I just wish we had time to feel their deaths more and how it affected the under other members of the crew. It just feels like they die and boom, the book's over. I agree. I agree. Uh, and there was this like one kind of moment where Sazed writes to Spooks, you know, I checked in. They're happy. They're okay. And that was it. And we just had to be okay because they were okay. Uh, also with that, Sean, there was just so less of an um, invested ensemble part of that, that um, it, yeah, it just didn't have as much weight. Uh, Chris says, I wrote Maud in Dresden fanfic, 40,000 words worth. Sean says, I fucking hated that so much. Oh man, I hate the trope of, I checked in with them and they're cool with being dead. It just does not work for me at all. <laughs> Billy says the deaths for me made the ending more beautiful. Um, anyone else want to answer if they happy that they died or wish they hadn't or you're okay with it because of X, Y, Z? Who wants to chat? Oh, we'll move on to the next. There's plenty to talk about. <laughs> this, yeah, uh, Michelle. So more of an observation that got me thinking is that when you compare the couple deaths here to the couple deaths in the Night Circus, it's really interesting. I think like the Night Circus had more of an emotional impact on me because you kind of see where they are in death, I think. And it, it was so abrupt here that it was like, and it's fine. This also reminded me of the last um, Chronicles of Narnia book, which I won't go into, but mm. it was kind of like this, like everything's fine-ish 
sort of ending. And, and so, I don't know, I think like when you do that, when there's a, supposed to be a big emotional moment, for me, it doesn't work as well. But it was fine. I it was like, I get it, but I don't know. It was fine. <laughs> yeah. I've definitely gotten that vibe from you over the last couple of books and the last couple of chats we've had about it. You're like, yeah, meh, yeah. I also think maybe this, like, maybe in the era where we're reading right now, a lot of these similar things have happened in plots and other books and in other mediums. So maybe it's all just getting very um, saturated into pop culture. Yeah. And becoming more convoluted because of that. Yeah. I get it. I hear you on that one. GK Gamer Fan says, I was shocked that both died. Tell me more about that, Gamer Fan. Um... All right, yeah, let's talk about Sazed. Um, I really, really loved that we got uh, how how it ended with Sazed, you know, how he more and more was getting revered and respected and he was, like, supposed to be in charge of Ellen wasn't. He was going through his own shit, but he was always the respect that we, the reader, got for Sazed. So when that kind of uh, arc transitioned to the fact that he was foreshadowed as being the literally the hero of ages. He's the god. He's the one who is reshaping the world. He has harnessed both of the powers of both ruin and preservation. And because his title as a terrorist man was to absorb, record, pass on information, he has all the insights of the last thousands upon thousands of years. He has all the religions and in these archives it's been documented what animals look like, what different worship looked like. He was the world bringer. Thank you, KP Dubs. Because technically Vin was the hero of ages, but then he was like, oh man, when they say ages, <laughs> that's me. It's a forever job. Um, yeah, the fact that Sazed was, you know, able to make all of these changes because he is balance. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting that the combination of ruin and preservation is creation. Um, but what does everyone think about Sazed? Sazed being uh, the god at the end, how this all came to fruition, how he got through his depression and despair and hopelessness how he would surprise even himself with these things. Let's chat. Sazed, who's up? Vaden. Yep. I love this guy. He's the best. Uh, yeah, Sazed's arc was particularly good because you see, you see the struggle. Like more than anyone else in the series, he struggles hard mm. with his faith, with everything, and with, with, with especially with Tinwell's death. And in the end, when he becomes like the savior of the world, essentially, and takes on the, the powers of ruin and preservation you know he uses all of his all the stuff he's learned throughout his life to make the world right again to, mm -hmm. to move things correctly he's able to you know talk to, kind of weirdly he can make spook of Wisborn. he can talk to apparently um ellen and vin and they're gonna say hey yeah, we're cool with being dead because they talk to him apparently um he's a god now yeah he's a god yeah. So, yeah so it makes you wonder if, if if he can because of that now he's able to talk to tidwell once again you know because that's one of the things he loved that's really sweet. Well, I mean, I remember when we were talking about the end of the second book, A Well of Ascension, um, one of the comments made was the fact that previously Sazed was almost mechanical in the fact that he had a purpose, but he wasn't necessarily a person. Uh, and then he went through love and loss, which really opened up his humanity. It humanized him. And I feel like would he have been the same kind of God at the end of the book, one that has compassion, one that, uh, you know, because he was kind of frightened. He goes, how am I I'm just not going to be the next Lord Ruler? And it's like, I think that because of Tindwell having loved her and ha received love and also losing her and understanding despair, he's got an absolute grasp on ruin and preservation and in, in a way creation. And I think that having access to that humanity that he's experienced has actually set him on the path. So he needed that kind of thing to happen to him. 
to be the god that he is. Yeah, I mean, I would agree because like he had, he was so duty bound for most of his life. That's all it was. That's all he had essentially. But with Tin Will, it made him a better person, made him empathetic, made him understand you know mm-hmm. people's hearts rather than just their their minds. So and consequence, yeah. I liked that. I'm going to read some of the comments out. Um, I think the works getting rebirth overshadowed. Oh, the world, sorry. PK, uh, Lord Demon says, I think the world getting rebirth overshadowed Vin and Ellen's death. I kind of agree. A lot was happening at once that it, we, I think what Sean was saying earlier, we just didn't have enough time to process it all. Um, Kate says, Ferrochemy was always described as the balance power between allomancy and him, hemology. Uh, that makes sense that a ferrochemist would be the god in the middle. Yeah, it literally is the essence of balance. I liked that. Vaden says, says it was the best character in the trilogy, in my opinion. I wonder now if his ultimate, his ultimate power as a god, now he can talk to his love Tindal, which is what you just said. Um, PK says he was a walking hard drive. Mm-hmm. GK says, when I read the trilogy, I was used to books where the heroes come out on top and expected Vin to survive at least. Hmm. Billy Sunrider says the fact that Sanderson took the most annoying part about the entire trilogy for me, all of the religion talk, and made it mean something blew my hat off. Uh, Jimmy says, I would say that Sazed is a great example of not giving up, which is another word for that, preservation. Sean says this trilogy and the franchise as a whole are so weird to me because of how the Cosmere is treated so much like the MCU. It's almost like this trilogy is both the story of Vin and Ellen's life, but it's also like Caesar's origin story. It's very weird in a way, and I don't know if I think it's good or not. No, that's a really interesting observation, though. Thank you. Toast Poster says Vin and Ellen had to die to fulfill the prophecy. Caesar was next in line to rule. Good chats about that. We've touched on it a little bit about Marsha's arc. How did we find the evolution but the downward spiral of marsh as a character kp dubs i saw you unmuted chime on in well i was actually going to talk more about Caesar. do it um yeah you know, his his purpose in life that he always thought was to store up all this knowledge of all the people for a thousand years and then when the time came use that knowledge to re-educate the people it turned out to be much more transcendent metaphysical he used the knowledge to create the world show the people plants not just tell them about flowers he made flowers yeah so i just thought that was like very very powerful for me that he just went to that next level and it was so much more encompassing the entire world than just talking to a classroom full of people yeah yeah his purpose just imploded (laughs) I'm glad you mentioned that. That's a really good, really good observation as well. Uh, Vaden says, yeah, he did. He says it brought back Mare's dream of a world with flowers. I loved that as well, honouring that. Um, True Scorn, I am going to get to that in a hui bit. So hold that thought. Um, anyone want to chat about Marsh? Marsh is a character, Marsh is purpose. We just earlier spoke about the fact that Kind of like Beric Dondarrion in Game of Thrones, his entire life and the purpose of his life weighed on one action. One action. Um, Did we like Marsh as a character? What are we feeling with that? Sean says, I think Marsh was the biggest surprise of the trilogy for me. I didn't really expect the character to be as relevant while reading the book as he ended up being. Hmm. Kate says, I really liked his character. Let's have a chat about that, Kate. Yeah, I just really liked that he was like the villainous force throughout two thirds of this whole series, but you could see that it took everything for him to hold that last little sliver from ruin and nobody thought he would even the readers didn't think he would be anything even ruin didn't think he would be anything like he just kind of forgot he existed for a while because he was too busy like messing with Vin. and it just took that one little sliver of humanity to undo everything what i thought was really interesting was like in the first third of the book 
you got a point of view from Marsh where he was thinking and you learn that he does have cognizance, that he is consciously sort of aware of what's going on and that he's losing himself to ruin um, and that he can't really act out. He definitely can't say anything. He is being pulled like a, a puppet with the strings. Um, but the fact that that seed was planted, but then the more the story progressed, he is just a frightening loose cannon. He is losing all control. He is killing people. He's um, torturing them. He, you know, we see some of the, some of the acts that he's he's what he's capable of doing, and you're just sort of sickened by it all. And then when it says, you know, the average uh, inquis uh, inquisitor has something like twelve spikes, Marsh is pushing thirty. You're like. This guy is just powered up and he is like Poison Ivy's Bane, you know. Um, he's just being jacked up to serve as a super soldier. And so, yeah, there was a part where you're um, the reader going like, is it too late? This could have happened, but it's not looking like it could, ha it could happen. So that was a nice moment. Um, Marsh's character was amusing. He had layers and much pain, hurt. Yes. Sean says, I love that he's kind of introduced in the book one, sorry, as living in Kelsey's shadow. And then we see him outlive his brother and be like the only person who saw his brother for who he truly was. Mm. Uh, and the cartographer says, I really liked that we got to see Marsh's point of view. It was a nice compliment to the rest of the characters. Well, I mean, you're really seeing a lot of these characters, um, like the layers, which is what um, Sprinkles was kind of saying, all these layers. Uh, the first one we just learned about that alimentic powers. So like, you know, when they're on the heist, what, who does what? Then by book two, you sort of learn that Breeze isn't the asshole that he's telling everyone he is. He is incredibly sort of like compassionate um, he's helping people when they're down. He's constantly making people feel a little bit better about themselves and, and helping in those particular ways um, and in often very selfless ways. Uh, and he pushed himself to a limit where he cracked um, during the war um, because, you know, for someone who's positioned themselves to be the most selfish of them all, we learned that that was all a bit of BS. Uh, we learned Mm, a little bit about Ham. He has a family. I would have loved to have learned more about Ham. He was philo uh, philosophizing and then he didn't. Um, I would have loved to have seen Breeze's relationship explored more, especially um, Elriand. Like that was going really kind of cool and then mm, I didn't really get it. Catch22 says, hey, everyone, what's happening? Just got home from work. Wanted to pop by and say hi. His wife's name was probably Cheese. <laughs> And their last name's Croissant. <laughs> Sandwich. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, that was, a, he was, Ham was the most sort of two dimensional of them all. But then, you know, we saw Spook. Spook really came into his own, um, this book, uh, where he just felt like he was a favor. He was only introduced because um, his uncle Clubs was like, this is my nephew. He's in on this. Thank you, Vaden. Ham definitely was the most underdeveloped character from Kelsey's crew. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with Spook, uh, he was this awkward kid who had a crush on Vin in book one. He, we started to see the weight of not being as experienced or as necessary or as um, a valued member in the team and the consequence and effects of that. Uh, and then in book three, we see the fact that he felt like he abandoned clubs, his uncle. Um, and now he had, he really had something to prove. Um, we learned that he is infiltrated by Ruin and Ruin took the disguise of Kelsia, his hero, the guy he looked up to more than anything. Uh, and Ruin indirectly really let Spook come into his own, matured him, experienced him, um, or, you know, made him gain experience and essentially level up in the Brando Sando terms that we've kind of been talking about. Uh, there's Doritos in there. Is my brother in here? Is that why? Or are you just hungry, Jimmy? Um, 
So yeah, learning about sort of spooks dimensions was fantastic in this book. Uh, super, super necessary as well. I just wish in this third book, we got a little, little bit more about the remaining team members that we've experienced three books through, you know, we've gone through so much. I just thought that was lacking a little bit. Miss Necromancer says Beldra's character was hella annoying to me because she really was just the girlfriend and it's such a boring, stupid trope. I get where you're coming from from that. She definitely felt like a stage five clinger. Uh, I, I liked that there was a little bit of a curveball in the fact that she was supposed to be this absolutely green, helpless, uh, helpless, sorry, uh, wafty, dainty wisp of a character, but it turns out that she was the bodyguard of her brother. She was the um, misting. She had a lot more cleverness behind what we thought. Um, and I think what they were trying to do with that was Spook just wanted a girlfriend. Spook was cracking on Devin. He just wanted, like, that was a part of his need and desire for worth. And that's a patriarchal bullshit thing I want to get behind. That if a guy's not getting laid, then he's got, then he's uh, got no purpose. That you're only a man if your manhood's getting worked. Ugh, that's so annoying. But that's kind of like the payoff that they gave to Spook because he just wanted to be a man. And so they're like, here's a girl who's obsessed with you. Great. Uh, Kate says her way of bodyguarding him was, please don't hurt him. <laughs> oh, you wanted me to eat the Doritos. That's so funny. <laughs> uh, just so people understand, Dorizo is my brother's um, tag. So usually if he pops in, the Doritos go flying. Um, anyone else have thoughts on Beldre and Spooks then? Um, on Spooks arc, on Spook being the, one of the first ones to recognize that the voice isn't what it seems, that the voice is someone who's got uh, nefarious sort of uh, desires. Sean says part of Spook's storyline that made me sob was when he heard, I named you Spook. You were my friend. Isn't that enough? <laughs> mm, that was sweet. Anyone want to get, do anyone want to speak spook? Oh, that's what I thought was really interesting as well. The fact that, you know, spook's whole interesting thing was that he spoke street slang. And then I was like, a thousand year old entity is not going to understand street slang. And when he was writing on the board, and Belger's like, I can't understand a word of this. I was like, neither can ruin. I thought that was super interesting that they positively weaponized the thing that was that uh, he was made fun of. Sean says, what do you think of that voice he heard? Kelsey's voice was ruined. He recognized that. He learned that. And then when he was talking to Kelsey and then he saw the citizen, what's his name? Uh, also look in that direction and be like, oh, I'm trying, I'm doing what you want. He was like, holy shit, this is not a figment of my imagination. Quellian, thank you, Vaden. This is not a figment of my imagination. It's a different person for him. We're all getting played here. Abandoned ship. Uh, Ruin appearing as Kelsey was the reddest of red flags, says M, the cartographer. The problem with that, though, like some red flags, because we want it so bad, we're willing to ignore the reddest of these red flags. Because Spook's, uh, Spook wanted Kelsey's adoration approval so much that when we're talking about the first half of the book where it's like, hey, if you hear voices, guys, wake up, not a good thing. But when it's someone that you trust and you're just, yeah, so desperate for their validation, you're willing to believe the best. Vaden says, Kelsey came back so many times, ruin for Spook, also the first time to start the religion, and then Ten Soon in this book all showed up as him. I will say, though, that Ten Soon becoming Kelsey was a bit of a blip, and I don't think that it had enough of a payoff. I don't think it added enough to the story. I think it's because he could, so he did, but just because you could doesn't mean you should. Anyone got something to add with uh, Ten Soon becoming Kelsier? 
was sort of important in the way it played out because if Tinsoon hadn't been Kelser, hadn't talked to the two guards and the people outside the church, then not only would the population of Luthadel not moved over to the pits of Hathsin, but the 380 Mistings wouldn't either because they would have still been in Luthadel. Thank you. Thank you. I needed and to hear that, the snowball effect. So they wouldn't have been able to, you know, have any safe place for any of that population. Yeah. Yeah, uh, hide out for the end of the world and the ATM would have been captured because there wouldn't have been that whole army to defend it. Yeah, okay. I'm sold. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe it just didn't, you know, scream it at me in the book. Um But yeah, uh, Lisa says it got the army to the right place. Michelle said he did accidentally save a bunch of people. <laughs> um Uh, and then Sean says, did you read the voice that encouraged him by saying that he named him as being the same as Ruin? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you read the voice that encouraged him by saying that he named him as being the same as Ruin speaking to Spook then? Can you help me with that a little bit better? It's not sinking into me the way that I want. I think you want it to. I think what he's saying Thanks. is when... When uh, Spook heard Kelsier at the end, it was actually Kelsier. It wasn't Ruin. Oh, uh, that was a message from Sazit. And this is uh, the kind of the point that Vaden was bringing up earlier. Now that he is one with all and has everything, can he talk to Tindwall? Um, and I think in this instance, he was able to talk to Kelsier. And Kelsier's like, or oh, maybe it was something that was mentioned age, ages ago. Is Kelsier watching? I don't know. That one's a little bit wishy-washy. But Spook being gifted Mistborn powers was apparently Kelsey's idea and what he wanted Spook to have. I am so glad Spook's a Mistborn. I hope he uses that pewter and tin. Someone please say something. Yeah, there we go. Chris says 16% snap reveal. Let's talk about it. <laughs> okay, okay, cool, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> Woo. Um, 16% snap reveal. Yes, these mist come in. The mists have always been the monster. Mist is avoided at all costs. Then the mists start killing people, making people sick. The mists are coming out during the day. What is going on? All the um, signs pointed to the mists belonging to ruin. Ash was falling harder. Mists were showing up longer. And then there was the baptism process of dunk yourself in the mists and hopefully you're fine. What were the consequences? 16% of the population got sick. 16% got sick. How odd. Coincidence, as Ellen McBeige would say. Um, and then a 16th of those got sick for 16 times as long. What? The maths is checking out. It was on the tip of our tongues. I think it's because we didn't know there were 16. There were 14 for us at that stage. It was right there. Who saw or who had opinions about the mists? Because when we spoke last week, we did not know that mists were giving alimantic powers or creating mistborn. So what were people thinking about the mists? KP Dubs, you got thoughts? Oh, the snapping. Yeah, good point. Well, I mean, there was the fact that the mists were not affecting the nobility, so that should have been a clue that since the mists were just trying to hit the... Um... Ska, it was going after people who had not already been, you know, beaten by their parents and to, to determine if they'd snap or not. So that was one clue that they were trying to do something. Um, I last week I was theorizing that the earring in Vin's ear was some sort of positive thing that was going to help her in the long run, and mm -hmm. in a way it did, but it did let ruin in. But for the longest time, I wanted to believe there was some positive power helping the world, and then everything seemed to turn like, nope, it was ruined all the time. Finally, when the mists flowed into Ben at the end, I'm like, see, there was some positivity in the world. It's not all bad. Mm. 
And that was kind of, I, I just kind of like the fact that there was good in the world somewhere. It took a while to get there. KP Dubs, I have that same mentality. Give me hope. I need to know yeah. what hope looks, feels, and sounds like. Um, and that was kind of hard in the first book where it was like, hi, welcome to Mistborn. Life's shit unless you're these people. But even when you're these people, you get beaten to see if you have powers. So it's like there was so much despair. So I'm with you on that. It's like we just need a little bit of hope. I do think it was interesting, like this chosen one trope. We see it a little bit. But it was like, oh, they were just in the right place at the right time and a couple of things are like enough aligned for that to happen. Is Vin special? No. What do people think about Vin's chosen one reveal? Oh, thanks, Jimmy. That's sweet. Um, Vin's chosen one reveal. Any other missed conversations? One sixteenth. Thoughts? Mists? Concerns? Vin's chosen one? Michelle, Michelle, if you're going to type something that brilliant, I'm going to ask you to explore it. Uh, sure. So, like, the concept of duality kept popping up in the world building here, and Sanderson, I think, does a really great job of taking that, like, a theme like that and really acts absolutely baking it into the world because there's, you know, first we start with two metals and they have opposite, like, opposing forces, right? And then um, there's all this, like, real, it's all about this to one relationship and it goes back to preservation and ruin because in the story like they're not there is no morality to either of them they both cause irreparable harm but they're just doing what they're doing mm -hmm. right and so we have them manifest as mist and ash which if they're in the air mist and ash both cover light so that it diffuses light it creates gray uh, like a gray area, literally, mm, <laughs> like both mm. of those um, substance mist comes coming from rain has more of that like connotation with life and ash being burnt. Um, yeah, you know, comes from like volcanoes and stuff. But then there's like even through ash, ash is often used in gardening to add nutrients to soil and stuff. So it's all you know, it's it's just so interesting to me that that came about. Yeah, I really like that sort of exploration of duality because not only that, but then we had the creation, the, the part of creation was three the uh, ferrochemy, allomancy, and humorology. Humorology. <laughs> uh, Vaden, you were talking about the duality as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a ton of parts that were had to do with the. Have to do with the, the complementary elements of them, like like the each, each element being uh, having two parts to it, like the main element and then the alloy, and then there was usually being a, like a counterpoint to them. Ellen Vin being like the relationship in general was very complementary because Ellen was the idealist and she was a practical. True. Person. Yes. And then of course preservation ruin is another one, and there was and the, and the whole cause and effect general, like pushing and pulling, like just everything. The, the whole idea is cause and effect, right? Like something happens and the thing happens as a reaction, and it's mm. very more on the realistic side, it's more like a way to like make it seem realistic at least. So I enjoyed that. Martian Kelsia. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. PK Lord Demon says, I thought that since apparently Ruin was messing with the prophecy, all of it was just a lie. I was proven wrong with Caesar being the chosen one. KP Dub says, it turns out that the Mist and Ash were both helping the world. Ash was blocking the sun, the Lord Ruler's mistake, and Mist uh, as preservation was trying to make alamances. Yes. Yeah. Um, someone's in the document and they're, they're the anonymous jackalope, uh, but they've highlighted the fact that I wanted to talk about a personal story. I had a, uh, ruin and preservation dream last night, but it was sci-fi. It was really quite interesting. So obviously this whole notion in the book has just seeped into my subconscious, but it was, uh, you know how dreams are always like, oh yeah, no one gives a shit about your dream because you had it and it doesn't make any sense. I will say that there was an introduced sort of like, there was a, you know, that alien invasion trope where the aliens are always bad. And I, we kind of saw it a little bit with um, Project Hail Mary. I kind of got a little bit borrowed from that as well in this particular dream with like astrophage, where it's just like, you know, science, bitch. Science is what's happening. In this instance, we were, it's like a kind of guck material 
Kind of like the sludge from, uh, oh my gosh, 1992's forest animated movie. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I had three coffees today. Does anyone remember? Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Fern Gully. Thank you, Kate. Yes, Lisa, Fern Gully. So like that sludge, it was kind of invading earth and it was like an extraterrestrial, it was like a, a, an, a living organism. And everyone thought it was like a virus or a parasite because it was like sticking to things. It was like, oh my gosh, we've got this alien invasion happening. Um, and obviously the first thought was we have to destroy this thing. It turns out that... Uh, <laughs> Earth was dying because humans were killing it. The planet was literally like climate change, all this sort of stuff, fossil fuels. The planet was registered as this species as dying. So when it attached to something that was another living organism, it was healing it. It was um, providing the nutrients and it was regrowing the things that were dying. And I just thought that that was so interesting where this alien race, this guck, black sticky substance that people were like trying to burn away was um yeah right Gaia I thought it was like super interesting that the one thing that was trying to help us we wanted to instantly kill it and it was you know evil um but I woke up from that dream and I'm like oh and I think in the dream like my sort of like co uh conscious was kicking in a little bit consciousness was kicking in and I was just like you fucking idiots. Preservation has come. This is literally preservation and we are ruined. We have ruined and preservation is trying to help us. So we're trying to kill preservation. I was like, mm. anyway, that's how I dream. They're literally the dreams that I have. <laughs> Go figure. Um, I'm not a writer, Chris. I'm just not a writer. Anyway, that was a story that I wanted to share. Um, da, 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 da. Yes, Vaden, let's talk about the Matrix moment, the movie moment where I could hear the soundtrack drop, Vin versus 13 Inquisitors. Okay, well, yeah, that was definitely one of the best parts of the book and the trilogy in general. Because, um, you know, in general, when they're using their powers, it's it's kind of one at a time, and it's like, it's very limited, you know, they're burning metals or whatever. And now she's just going all out. Like, she gets all the powers, all, she's using all of them, like, consecutive. She's, she's burning, you know, under aluminum to enhance them to levels that they, they don't normally happen. Like, she has a mist power, everything, and she's just destroying these three, 13 quizzes at one time, including Marsh, who, as I said, like 30 spikes in them. Yeah. So, but the way that that read and played out, it was so visually wonderful where you could really see it. Like I could hear the music build up to like the anticipation for this showdown. Uh, yeah, Sprinkle says um, Vin is Neo and it was so that kind of thing. Um, it was raining during the scene. There was like a line in there where it was like 11 down, like or 12 down, one to go. And you just like, damn. like there would be like fourth, that was the fourth, you know, it was like basically counting them. And again, like you, oh, Michelle said Miss Bond would be such a cool anime. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. Vin being a petite black hair. Yeah, that in itself. Kelsia. Oh my gosh. Yes. God, it would be so good. Oh, Toaster Poster. Yeah, that's kind of about the same thing. Sean says it's so cool to think about how Kelsey has struggled so hard in the first book to kill a single Inquisitor. That's the thing. Like you felt those stakes, and this is a little bit of the stake inflation, but she literally did absorb all of the mist, <laughs> which had fewer alimantic powers, so it supercharged her. Um, but, yeah, this is the thing. Like when you saw an Inquisitor, it was kind of like, Hello, what was his name? Mr. Anderson. Like when you saw Hugo Weaving pop up, you're like, you're fucked. <laughs> and then all of a sudden there's so many of them and it's like pew, 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 when you take them all down. Sean says, to be fair, she actually, uh, she also actually knows how to kill them easily, which Kelsia didn't. Yeah, she'd figured out sort of like whip, what to pull. Hello, Mr. Anderson. There you go. Apparently she's Miss, Mrs whatever Bellen's last name was, v v v v v Venture. Venture. 
They needed to add venture into his life. <laughs> yeah, she dropped a building on them and just thought seven, eight, nine. Yeah, so good. Pianki says Vin has been training and fighting with her powers for longer than Kelsia had by that point. Really? I think she had more quality instead of quantity training. Do you remember when she was looking at Kelsia like, wow, this guy's like a god. This guy's so effortless with his powers and I'm so clumsy. Look how incredibly skilled he is. And then you cut to Kelsia and he's like, run, like I'm about to die. <laughs> and she's like, bye. And now she has like, pew, pew, pew. <laughs> so good. That moment would just be amazing. And Michelle, you planted the seed. I want to see this as an anime so bad. This book would be sick. I could, I always pictured Breeze as like Mr. Monopoly, <laughs> but he's an animated character. <laughs> I would, yeah, that would be just so cool. Ham would be like the thick with like the, you know, the hair that's drawn on like that down his arms. Sanderson, you made money on that Kickstarter. Give us an anime. Oh, what if it was like Mistborn was kind of in like the arcane animation that we've been seeing. <laughs> Kate says Breeze and Alrian, uh, Alrian are the Monopoly and Candyland crossover that we need. Uh, PK says Kelsey was a Mistborn for just a year. Sorry. Yes, I think when he was fighting an Inquisitor. Thank you, PK. Yeah, because he got out of the, um, he snapped in the Minds of Halcyon. Uh, Vaden says, yeah, she became the best Alamancer the world has ever seen. She killed the Lord Ruler, she destroyed 13 Inquisitors, and then annihilated the God Ruin. <laughs> and was still side, put, you know, cast to the side to build up fucking Bellend. Um, KP Dub says, Mord, I'm picturing your painting as something stored in, says it's copper, a beautiful view, long lost. Return to the world. Cute. Oh, Josiah Marshall has just subscribed to Geek Bomb's YouTube. Grr, arr. Thank you for that. Arcane had about 10 million per episode, apparently. I think it was 3 million per episode, but it was something redonk. Yeah. Oh, no, it was like... Yeah, like 300,000 per sec second. <laughs> no. Minute. Minute? I don't know. I heard something. My, my friend was a voice in it, actually, and just like told me all these incredibly mind-blowing facts and you think I committed that to memory? Mm -mm, I ain't no Sazed. I need to store shit. <laughs> Gone. Uh, Billy said he said he's going to do Mistborn live action, though I agree an anime would be amazing. I think live action can come across two steampunk matrix, but the, the anime, you could just, you could really not be confined by um, sort of like live action or CGI, you could just do so much with it. Like it would be a lot more limitless. All the things that you could do. Uh, you could actually see the quality, the monetary, the, you could see the money and the quality of animation for Arcane. Yeah. Toast Post says, I wish other people were there to see this epic fight, but yeah, that fight was so good. Uh, imagine says it with Google Docs. <laughs> Ruin his Wikipedia. That's funny. Michelle says, I was thinking the studio who did the Castlevania anime for Netflix. They usually do a lot more adult stories. Um, I I saw an episode of that. Should I get back into Castlevania? Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, what are the less desirable moments? What would you tweak? What were the moments where you were like, mm. <laughs> Bellend. <laughs> Bellend was beige. Agree. What would you tweak or fix with that though, Kate? How would you make it more interesting? Hello, Mr. BW. How well, are you, Brian? I feel like him being a misborn, get rid of that. <laughs> you could have done the same thing with having him be spiked the same way like Spook and Lord Penron and, you know, because everyone else had that going on. So why did he have to be a Mistborn? He could have had the same... Yeah, he may not have been the most powerful Mistborn ever, but, like, I feel like it took... Being a Mistborn took away from the parts of his character that made him like a, made us like him in the first book. 
because yeah. we were complaining about him in the first book like we I, liked his character a lot he was the bookworm who was trying to uh shun sort of like the bullshit um nobility shit that didn't matter like he was great i was like this guy's fantastic he doesn't care that he's you know, second in line for the most or first in line for the most powerful house. He doesn't care that he has all these responsibilities. He's trying to rebel against this bullshit that he didn't subscribe to. He was so interesting in the first book. And then, yeah, he just got really boring he just in his got relationship. More and more... It, almost, it just felt like, I don't know, he had to become this kind of paragon character which made him super boring, but it's like Ben already had that. So not only was he boring, but he was also redundant. And it's just like, you could have done that with Spook or with Alrien would have been a great choice for that too. It's just, it just made him like a dead weight of a character where and yet, in the end it's just his, and his death was just like, you know, Oh, I'm oh. just dead. Well, and yeah, ben because was just like, yeah, okay, he's dead. Bye. I, yeah, oh, we want to stay together in the afterlife. All right, fuck. <laughs> Boo. Um, the worst part about all of that is, yes, all those things were true, and yet he was still prioritized. Oh, we got to follow there. Hypnotizers, thank you so much. And thank you, Brian Foster, for three months sub. How was your stream? How did it go? How are you feeling? You probably didn't stream today. I've got a bit of a headache. I'm not feeling 100%. I'm okay. Vaden says, yeah, he was a political and philosophical nerd. I enjoyed him a lot. Enjoyed. Duh. Michelle says, Ellen needed to retain his snark from book one. His logic was taken way, uh, taken to way too high a level where he'd already talked himself out of his mistakes so we don't see him making many. Yeah. He was learning. <sighs> Some people like the character of Superman. Some don't. Jimmy says, much like the Book of Eli, I think it would have been interesting to find out that Vin was blind at the end. Oh, that's an interesting take. Hmm. Miss Necromancer says, Ellen shone in this book when he was having his discussions with Yeoman, which is where he was the strongest in the earlier books. Yeah, 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 because it was a battle of wit. Michelle says, I would love to have seen the uh, point of views of Beldre and Ulriand. If you're going to add girlfriends, at least give them some motivation. KP Dub said before that they were just pretty redundant in the entire story. Ellen was boring. Beldre and Ulriand did not need to be there at all. So let them have a need. Give them purpose. If you're going to add them in, like you can write great female characters. It's not that that was a difficult thing to do. Easily have some tweaks and invest a little bit better. Hello for David Blue. How are you, my man? How you been? We're talking about Mistborn. I don't. I think I checked to see if you'd read it and you hadn't. It's very good. Uh, Ulrian focused chapters would have been cool. She just was, she had so much potential to be interesting and it just, and like Breeze was still in the thick of it. He had like a big personal development in the second book and then there's so much potential there. Um, what else was a weaker part some people were saying kate you're one of them that it was just a little bit too religious this really at the end had birth of the world vibes uh, and i there was one part where i was just like mm. and that was and Caesar had learned from a religion about the placement of the stars and i was like you're just gonna put stars back or it was like, oh, they were going to put that earth back into the solar system. But there was a very much a big, uh, big bang. No, not big bang. There was very much a creation of religion is why we're all here, not science. I got that vibe. Chris's argument is, should this have been more than three books? No, <laughs> I couldn't have done another one. <laughs> There needed to be at least three though, but no more. That's a great question though. Anyone else? Should this have been more than three books? Oh, so that we could explore the other secondary characters more. Three was good. Uh, does anyone want to have their two thoughts about the preachy religious nature of the books? 
Is my microphone on? I'm just trying to drink more water. Yeah. I don't think Sorry. it was too preachy for me. Like, it fit, you know? When, when an author goes on to a topic like religion, as long as it really deeply fits the lore and the world building that he's doing in the background and the characters, when it fits all that together well, then it doesn't feel so much like it's preaching to me. It just feels like a part of the world. And, you know, religion is such a huge part of the last thousands of years mm. for us. You know, it makes sense that in pretty much any world or culture that's based on humanity that, you know, there's going to be religions and that's going to be mm. part of it for some people. And, you know, some characters, some people think religion is a whole bunch of BS and others don't. We had that throughout the books. Yeah. You know, a lot of characters not caring for the way Sazed was sort of preaching their religions at them, thinking it was sort of just ridiculous and his quirk and whatnot. Yeah. I I just like the way it was done. I agree. Uh, in the sense that it's like the fact that their religions were tweaked and they had to like use that as a puzzle to find out what was changed and so they could learn about Ruin's sort of deceit or, or message. Um there was a part though, two, two parts where it was a little bit dunk. And that was, even though there's all these religions and all of them had falseness and not all of them made sense, they had one thing in common, faith. And faith is why we're here today. And faith is why this book is made. And faith is why you'll turn the page. And I was like, ah, I feel like I'm in a sermon slightly. And then the other part was, and Spook walked out and there was a tome and in the tome was everything and it was a message from God. The tome was the Bible. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so there were the the only two kind of like references and, and the, the one where it's like, oh, using religion will figure out the science. Sean says, it's very on the nose. <laughs> but Kakahu, I totally hear what you're saying with it was a lot of talk with a bunch of purpose, which was a very necessary part of the storytelling, uh, that without it, we wouldn't have the story and it would have crumbled. Um, PK, oh, wait, sorry, Billy says the entire power system is based off of gods. So I don't see a way around it being a bit preachy. He's also very Mormon. <laughs> PK says, I just read it as all religions have some truth in it, which says it used to fix the world. True. Sean says, Miss Vaughn in particular is just filled with his Mormon background. Uh, Lisa says the tome was everything. Oh, <laughs> I didn't pick up on that. I just thought it was <laughs> right. Lisa says the tome was everything we read. Oh, no, I did pick up on that, actually. No, you're right. You're right. Uh, because he started making the journey, the journal entries. That all checks out. The tome is everything that we read in the epigraphs. Oh, okay. Um, any other gripes? The secondary female characters were underused and underwritten. Elland was a bellend. Um, anything else that was a little irksome? We needed more Luthadel. Sean, that's a really interesting thing. That's it. not enough smooching, Lisa, preach. <laughs> the main setting of the first two books just falls to shit off screen. Uh, that's actually a really, really interesting point because they're finding out where all the caches are hidden and Luthadel's was already explored. So they had to travel and go out. And it was all about trying to take over these two different. Hello at the laser G3000. I'm just squeezing you there. Sorry. Welcome to book chat. Um, but you're right. Yeah. It was about these two different cities when they split the party, um, and trying to establish authority in a way over them and then going underground and then find the location of the ATM. But I wonder, Sean, if a centralized location was unnecessary because Vin literally became a God. Let them smooch. Yes. I just noticed book clubs, literal saying that's, that's our motto. Sean says, I think if Sazed had been doing his storyline in Luthadel and had been witnessing how Ruin's influence was destroying it instead of us being told about it, that would have worked better for me. I definitely didn't need it to be centralized, but I wish that one of the storylines had been centered there. I think that's a really interesting argument to make. 
Um, my gripe was that the essence of the first book that was the most exciting, we'd lost that by the third book. And that was this ensemble team, this camaraderie. We'd, we'd kind of lost that a little bit. Uh, I mentioned last week that I liked the fact that they brought back the ballroom where it all began for Vin, Vin and Ellen and they had a dance. But something's better than nothing. Kate says like, maybe we could have seen more of Penrod falling into a Nero-like madness with the city. Um, Penrod was such an interesting gain. Like I pictured Ruin literally um, making characters on the chessboard and Penrod became like a bishop and was just so underutilized. And then when he was found having committed suicide and a little bit of hearsay going, yeah, he got a little bit mad. <laughs> what a dead end so quickly. Um, Sean says exactly we're told about it, but I just really wish we'd seen it. And he brought out a book while dancing <laughs> and she's like, Oh, whatever. And he's like, Oh, I'm exactly the same as I was. And it's like, no, you're not. You're fucking boring. Uh, Eduardo Naranjo 19. Thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to book chat. We're talking about the Mistborn series. Uh, Oh shoot. Mods. We really do need a exclamation mark book club um thing to talk about the book that we're reading and a little bit about it huh yeah kp dub says yeah penrod it's basically i leave you in charge cut to six months later oh he was nuts and burned the town down <laughs> yeah um she says i was i was excited about the scavenger hunt aspect of the beginning with the storerooms but the storyline kind of just fizzled for me yeah, because then it became ATM. They went to these two places and the thing that they were looking for wasn't there. And then it's like we had to keep caring and I didn't. But then when I found out that the ATM was Ruin's body um, and that he was sort of like blind to metal locations, that was kind of interesting. Because it, it displayed a weakness. Ruin could hear everything, everything said, everything done. There was such an almightiness behind him that for him to have a blind spot and Achilles heel without having legs. I don't know. I thought that that was quite interesting. Um, I really wish we got to see, ah, oh, I just got the ATM joke. Oh my God. KP dubs. You said it before and it went over my head. That's really brilliant. ATM is literally ATM that you can withdraw. That's very clever. Oh, Vin says, I wish we got to see Tinville's point of view in book two before she died as he passed away off screen. Oh. Sean says my big, biggest disappointment with the series isn't in this book, but it is related to the issues of losing focus on the crew post book one. I feel like Doxon was criminally underused. Oh, she, sorry, as she passed away off, off camera, off screen. I get you. Yeah, Vaden, Tinville was so important. Yeah, I hear you on that. Uh, Sean, that's my gripe as well. And I understand that when you do a series, if the first one, the genre is heist, you kind of pivot it a little bit. Um, but we're talking about kind of comparing books and I've seen a lot of on book talk, I've seen a lot of recommendations where if you like Mistborn or if you like Six of Crows, it would recommend the other. Uh, Six of Crows also very uh, like steampunk in a, um, you know, particular magic type universe, the Grisha verse, but the way that Lee Bardugo wrote about this ensemble, you would die for these characters. So they'd established the world building in the Shadow and Bone series, so they really got to focus on character development here. I know that book one was a lot of exposition and learning about this new world, um, and it was quite a complex magic system to describe because there's a lot of powers quite quickly as well. Um, but yeah, book two and three, the magic of that character development of the crew. And you're right. They killed Doxon off. That was just whatever. He had like one little conversation in the last book about, Ooh, has the Kandra got Doxon? I kept picturing him as Colin Firth, by the way. Um, Vin just accepted Ellen's death. Her motivation was to protect him. And when he died, Vin said, I said goodbye to him already. <laughs> That's so true. I saw him die. Even though he came back and he was a, a, mis a misborn, I was like, yeah, I just, I, I'm just, I've already said goodbye to you. So eh, you can die and it's okay. 
That's a, yeah, Toaster Poster, that's a really, really funny comment to make. That's great. KP Dub says, my alimantic power is burning the little known metal. Dub Niam, it gives you super fast pun powers. <laughs> Billy says, yeah, I, am I the only one that enjoyed Ellen's journey from a starry-eyed youth to benevolent tyrant? And I'm okay with that. Hey, Billy, sell it to us. I'd love, this is the thing about book chat and book club. Like everyone has a very different perspective on this. If this is something that you absolutely love, I want to hear your your thoughts and perspective on it and why you love it so much. And chances are you'll convince us and see uh, l allow us to see it in a different way. Oh, Zelda. Um, and the Mistborn powers were a large part of that journey, Billy continues. Um, Michelle says, I feel like Sanderson was almost there with the tightening, uh, with tightening the second and third books up, with book one being the heist, book two being the siege, and then book three being the race slash hunt. Yeah, really well, really well said and observed. That's really good. Uh, I'll wait for Billy to, sorry, I'm putting on the spot, Billy, but I want to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, Chris says a change would be that Ellen dies at the well. And then Vin, Vin says, has a, I can save him with Marsh. Oh, would that mirror the whole Zane story a little bit too much? It definitely worked in the last book, but I wonder if that would be a little bit repeat. But Ellen dying. She could have her Tindall moment. She finally found someone that she loved and trusted. And then she turns into a little bit of a whoop whoop. Billy, well, he went from wanting to have like a democratic society in book two, and then he got the powers and decided that he had to take over to save the world. I really liked that journey. He needed to have the powers that way. He could have, uh, he could have the journey. I think that's a really interesting thing that I didn't really think about too much. This is a guy that definitely tried to have a democracy and the trial and error on that was just cringy. It didn't work. People had to die. And then he felt himself with these powers going, I have the kind of powers that I could become the Lord Ruler and I'm becoming a tyrant. And it kind of sat badly with him, but not enough for me to give a shit. Uh, Sean says, I do love that each Mistborn book feels like an, it's almost a different subgenre from the others. It goes from a heist book to a political thriller uh, to an end of the world story. Oh, to a redacted. Sean, can you just tell me what the redacted word is? I'm okay with spoilers. Uh, we are going to wrap things up here though. Next month, we are reading The Martian by Andy Weir. We read Project Hail Mary back in January and we loved it. So for Sci-Fi May, we're going to read The Martian. So your homework is to read the first book. Uh, come on by to the reading section on Discord, which is only accessible if you are a Patreon backer. But Lisa is next year. She says, oh, bye-bye. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, did you just come on by? Sorry. Um, I Oh, you know what? I have the book. I can open it up and see how many chapters there are and we can halve them so that we know. You got it, Liz? Um, according to... According to my uh, Audible, it's 26 chapters, so I guess read to chapter 13. Well, there are, oh, I see. The log entries are like that. There are 26, so 13. I like that. 13, first 13 chapters um, of Martian. And the date of our part one will be the 4th of May. It'll literally be Star Wars Day, May the 4th. We'll be chatting about that. And then on May the 11th, we'll be reading, uh, we'll be talking about the entire book. Ah, oh, next issue, just out of time. We do start at five o'clock on the first and second Wednesday of the month. Uh, if you're a part of Nerdist's Book Club with myself, Hector Navarro and Rachel Hine, we will be reading Dark Matter by Blake Crouch. Um, and that will be, we'll be discussing the entire book on Nerdist's YouTube page, Geek and Sundry's Twitch, and on Nerdist's Facebook page on the 27th of April. So swing on by. We are getting our sci-fi on for the next like six weeks even. Toaster Poster says, I'm excited for the Martian. Eee. Martian May. Sean says the Martian is so good. Such a funny book. Um, 
Jack says, night is poop potatoes. That's a Martian reference for sure, if you've seen the movie. Uh, so apparently one of the biggest comments is that the book is way, 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 way funnier than the movie. The movie kind of explores the science behind it, but Andy with his humor is amazing. Lisa says the movie was on last night. And Jimmy says, hopefully Hector likes this new book. <laughs> right? Um, let's see if we can't just make someone's night by reading. The movie was funny, but the book is so much funnier. Who are we going to raid? Oh, it's Monday night. It's Wednesday, but he's on. Uh, uh. My favorite, Jason Charles Miller. Oh, yeah, he's on. Jason Charles Miller is a musician. He's fucking talented. He's so, so, so good. JCM, absolutely. We are going to go say hi to Jason. Give him some gig bomb love. Make sure we drop some bombs. He's the best. It's a free concert. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'll see you over there in the chat. Uh, and I will see everyone in two weeks' time for some dark matter. Goodbye, book chatters.